Hi, everyone. Uh, like you said, my name is Scott Murphy. Um, so I broke it. Wiggle this. Did we come back? OK, good deal. All right, so um, I guess, first of all, before I get started, um, I just want to say thanks to Jordan for organizing this. Um, I, it's my favorite meetup by far. I go to a couple. Uh, functional programming is what we do at Plow, and so it's really nice having something like this uh, just close at hand and to be able to go and see new stuff. There have been some great talks last year, um, and I hope for some really good ones this year too. So, um, so Servant is a type-level DSL for a web API. So there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, phrases there. We'll kind of go through all of them and maybe try and make this make sense. I, I, I wanted to ask, uh, show of hands, how many people have written any Haskell here? OK, this will be fun. OK, so um, let's talk a little bit. Before we get into what Servant is, I want to talk a little bit about types and programming, which is unsurprising for if anybody knows anything about Haskell programmers, they're all about types. So. Um, a view of types is a method of capturing and verifying some of what can be known about a program before it's ran. Uh, I like to think of types this way. I think of them as a specification, and then the program is the implementation uh, for something. So here's, here's an example. You'll hear me during the course of this talk talk about things being at the type level or being at the, sorry, I want to see that showed up. Yeah, being at the type level or being at the value level. And there are two sorts of terms that we're concerned with. Um, they are the two sorts of terms we're concerned with. Um, type level terms are for specifying what is expected from a program, right? So um, the compiler will, you know, if you say I'm going to write a function and it's going to take an int and return an int, that's what you expect out of the program, right? Or at least to some degree that's what you expect out of the program, right? There's actually a lot more to it, but uh, that's like a bare minimum of what you'd expect. So here's an example function, combine, right? And now combine takes an int at the type level, combine takes an int and a string and puts them together as an int and string pair, right? Down here at the value level, it takes some variable i and some variable s and puts them together as an i and s pair, right? So int and string are gonna be terms at the type level, i and s are your variables at the value level. Okay, so when I say term, I either mean something like this, like this whole structure here, or I mean like a single variable or a single item. Um, in fact, this arrow is also a part of a term. Um, we're going to be talking about some stuff that's a, a, a little bit uh, intimidating the first time you see it, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to get through it. And um, if you have any questions, stop me at any time. I'm totally willing to go into it. But um, uh, so that's just a little bit of prelude. And I want to talk about uh, just because a program has the ability to give you very highly defined types, does, or a programming language has that ability, doesn't mean you have to do that. Um, the decision on how much specificity you want in your programs is up to you, the programmer. Um, type functional programming languages like Haskell and Scala, they give you a lot of tools in order to be able to do it. But believe me, I've seen plenty of Haskell programs written that have absolutely no more type information than you know a C program or maybe even a, like a Python program or a JavaScript program. Although that's maybe pushing it. But uh, so here's an example of using Haskell, like I said, to encode data without a lot of specificity. So looking at this, we have this we have this function build customer entry. It's got a string and a string and a string, and it returns a customer. So it's not that it's telling us nothing, right? Like it tells, especially from the point of view of the computer, it knows exactly what data types it should expect and that it returns a customer. Um, and you can see a little bit of a hint of what's wanted if you look at it at the value level. We've got a name and an address and notes, and then you know something that's going to implement a customer. But not a lot of information at the type level. So if we we're gonna encode that same function with a little more specificity at the type level, we'd end up with something like name, address, notes, and then that returns a customer, right? Then down here you have name, address, notes, the same as before. So this means now that we know what to expect name to be. It's not just any string, it has to be something that conforms to what we've decided a name should be. It's not just any string for address, but something that conforms to what we expect an address to be. So that's, that's the general idea of a well-specified typed program. Um, but, you know, there is a trade-off here, right? So, like, 
if this is string, 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 and customer, and I hand this to somebody who knows Haskell but doesn't know anything about this build customer entry function, they understand string, 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 right? Like they know what to put in there. Here, they might not be sure, and they're gonna have to do some more investigation. So in terms of this, a function that's this simple, you know, there's not a lot of difference there. But when, you're, when your functions start to get more complex, that difference can be important. And that's why you'll see a lot of library functions, especially that will be written in this form. You'll have string, 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 and then some output. Um, however, you know, if you're writing application code, I, I really think this is a much better style. Okay, so uh, here are a few tools for doing more advanced typing in Haskell, and I'll go over them. So this first thing is proxy, and you'll see me use this as I go, th go through code later. So what is a proxy? Well, let's look at this data proxy A. This side of it is going to be at the value level, and then this side of it is at the type level. So at the value level, proxy doesn't do anything. It just has a placeholder named proxy. At the type level, it has an A, and that A, can, whoops, and that A can be filled in with any type that you want. Any type that you want to put there, you can put there. So as an example, here I have proxy, and then I put a string, uh, uh, a type level string, which is example string literal here. So in Haskell, you can write strings at the type level or the value level, and then you can move it from the type level to the value level using symbol val, right? So here is a string at the type level. I run symbol val on my proxy, and now I have a string at the value level. So when you're trying to write things like specifications, this can be incredibly useful. And that's why I wanted to take a moment just to talk about it. Um, you'll see it later on whenever I get more into servant. But um, that's all that's happening here is this is actually a type. And if I took this proxy and another proxy with a different string, um, they would be different types. Any, any different string would be a different type. But it would represent this A. Everybody, yeah. I am defining the type proxy here. Now it is in base, so I wouldn't actually have to define it myself. It's in the it's in the Haskell base library or Prelude library, um, but but I am defining it. No, it's not in Prelude. It's just in base. Uh, but I am defining it right here, and you can you can just make one and use it yourself. Um, the stuff like symbol val is defined for you in that proxy library, and it's really nice to have that to be able to use it. Um, operators can also be declared at the type level. Um, this is a pretty unique thing and something you're probably not used to seeing in a programming language, but you can define an operator like this. So remember earlier I said that, that there's a type level language and a value level language going on at the same time in Haskell. Well, if you, if you heard language, then you'd expect operators for a programming language. This could be an operator here, and basically it combines a path and then some A, some other type A is combined with this. So just like, just think of it the same way you would a tuple. It's combining two different things. Um, it's not a general tuple. It's, it's, it's specifying, you know, a little bit about what it's combining. I don't want to get too much into that, but if there are any questions about it, you know, feel free to ask. So let me, let me stop before I go too much further. Everybody good? Any questions? Okay. Probably, Yeah. Yeah, so he was asking um, what this star is, and he actually gave the answer. It's, it's a kind. Um, in the newest Haskells, kind is actually the type type. Yeah. So type and kind are the same thing now. But uh, all kind was was the, if you have a, like I said earlier, uh, types are their own program, programming language. Well, if they have their own programming language, well, then what's the types of the things in the type programming language? An obvious question. The answer... Right, so the answer at, used to be kind, and now the answer is type. Um, but so there's actually, in the, in the Haskell code now, there's a thing that says star equals type, and so they're the same thing. Um, so yeah, that, that is a little bit old school. Like, that should probably say type now. I don't know, that's interesting. But all the compilers and stuff still say star, so whatever. Um, anyway, moving on. Just showing you, you're gonna see a bunch of stuff that's happening at the type level and the and the value level. Um, 
this is an operator and this, I think, this will be most of what I'm gonna talk about, so that should get us by. If you see something that doesn't make any sense or looks confusing, just, just stop me and ask me. Okay, so typed web services, right? Um, before, before I even talk about any of this, I want to show this right here. So the whole point of what I'm talking about is having types that tell you a lot about what's happening. I feel like you can look at this and already know a lot, right? So you know a couple things. If you know something about web services, you see this get, and it's gonna mean that you're expecting something back, right? JSON and game, just guessing you might guess, it's gonna be serialized as JSON when it comes back, and it represents some type, which is a list of games. Um, that's a lot of information to get from not having a single line of code. Um, you probably don't, probably be a little bit confused by what this is, um, but maybe if you think about this slide that we just showed, and think about that we have string level literals, and then this piece, uh, you might figure out that this is, you know, has something to do with what's going to be returning the games. But that might be a bridge too far. I, it, it looks that way to me, but I, I've looked at it a lot. So um, anyway, I think this is really neat to, to be able to specify this much about a, um, about a single route so easily. And um, like I said, this is a DSL. So um, when I think DSL, I think grammars. Like you should expect to see a grammar. Expect to be able to specify lots of terms. Um, oh, I like that information. Good job, Scott. Um, so this list API right here is now uh, equivalent to this. So anyway, you're, anywhere you write list API, it's the same as writing this, okay? But this is a, this is a very complicated type, right? Like there's one, two, three, four, five different terms in this one type. So that looks like a grammar to me, and in fact it is, and in fact the grammar is well-defined. So this is the grammar from the servant paper, and again, these are all things that are happening at the type level, which I think is really interesting, and uh, I was really excited to kind of show people. So uh, the, the API is probably the most interesting one. So you have an API whose members consist of other APIs, items, and methods, right? So looking at this line here, you have an item and then our caret symbol and then API. So this is how you add something, construct an item into an API, and then a method, how you construct a method into an API. And then you can kind of look through and see all the different stuff. And I'll have some examples of how all this is used, but um, uh, one other cool thing about Haskell is that uh, if you guys know any grammar notation, Haskell and grammar notation look almost like exactly the same, so you get really used to looking at uh, grammars and um, it's nice. So symbols at type level string and then path is a symbol. But you know, if you know something about web programming, I feel like you can already get a lot of stuff out of this because you have your get puts, posts, query params, query flags, uh, JSON, HTML, plain text, C type. So that's probably like you know what's being constructed. Um, Anyway, moving on. Okay, so let's look in more detail considering our grammar about this list API. So we have our little caret thing, and as we saw here, the caret thing adds a item to the API, and we can look at what games is. Well, games is a type level literal that is the item being added, right? So if I look at my list of things that can be items, uh, the very first one is a path. So now we know what that games is. It's the path. It's the path that we're adding. Um, so here we're defining the path. So this would be what you'd expect after you know your local host slash, it'd be slash, oops, slash games. Again, we already kind of went over this. The get is coming back and then the different parts, the content type and the return type. Okay, so... Um, when I hear that something has a domain-specific language, another thing that I'm always thinking about when I hear about domain-specific languages and something that I love about programming like that, programming linguistically, where you kind of break um, problems into uh, domain languages, is that you can have interpretation on your language. In other words, you don't have to always have it make a server. You can have it make a server or a client or 
you know, generate your documentations or maybe help you generate tests. Um, and in fact, Servant is able to do all those things with that same API specification. And we'll kind of go through a couple of those examples. So the first example, and uh, probably the most important one, is the interpretation of that API as a server. So um, this is the equivalent of your compiler or interpreter, serve, and it expects an API, kind of ignore these little details, I don't, I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but it expects an API and then this is some other information that you can provide to an interpreter. Um, so here's the proxy that we saw earlier, right? So we're taking our API and we're moving it from the type level to the value level. That's what that's all about. And then we're gonna return, a, we're gonna then also provide it this, which is a list of functions that can be used to implement that API. That's exactly what this is. And then all together you get an application. All right, so everybody's good? We're, no, we're, we'll, we'll go through an example of that. I mean, like this was confusing as can be to me the first time I saw it, so. Um, here I kind of just went through and replaced API everywhere with list API. And again, remember that list API, everywhere I write list API, it's act, the compiler is gonna be replacing that with this entire expression, right? So this is just shorthand for us. But I could have just written that in all these spots, I mean, because it is a type, like it's no different than list API. All right, so here's an example, a fully implemented example of that server, okay? So uh, here, is our, here is our function that implements the route in our API, and then here's me calling it all together. So serve, and then the list API that I have, which is gonna be proxy list API, and then list games H. When I run it, uh, I, get, I get a web server, and I can uh, call that really fast. Games. And then here all, are all, all the uh, soccer games up until last week in the EPL. And um, Manchester City is having a very good year. But it is, uh, it's, really, it's really nice to be able to, to do stuff like that pretty easily. Um, you can spin up simple servers very, very quickly once you get used to doing this. Uh, we have a developer and he really got started in Haskell and uh, he learned how to write a servant client before he learned how to curl a website, which is pretty hilarious, um, I think. So um, speaking of which, here's the client, right? So same API, but now we're gonna implement it as a client. So if we're implementing it as a client, we're expecting it to hit a server and get a request from it. Um, again, our same API, so nothing's different here. Just the things that you would expect to be different are, um, you give it uh, a few things. Um, hold on, okay. You'll give it a few pieces of data uh, like the proxy list API but now instead of it returning, uh, first of all, it doesn't ask for anything else. That's one thing to notice here is it's not asking for any other thing. It's just asking for that list API um, because the client's gonna generate all the functions for you, right? Uh, and when it does that, you'll get a list of functions that you can then use to get route, to get information back from the web server. Um, yeah, so I think what I meant to do here was fill this in with list API and then I forgot, forgot to, but oh well. Um, let me, I kind of wanted to stop for just a second and go into like how, how this process is happening, right? So here we have this really clean function. How is it actually decomposing what's in list API? And that's what I think I was getting to, that's what I'm getting to in this slide here. Okay, so I'm gonna show how it decomposes just one member of it, because that, that entire grammar, every single thing in that grammar has to be done this way, but um, we, have a, we have some client that has a path and an API, just like we saw in the grammar. Um, so what we have to do is declare an instance of has client, which is our interpreter, and that instance of cl has client has to then handle this type, which is path API. Um, it does that by pulling it out of the type level and into the value level. It does that down here, right? So now it's grabbing that, pa that path that we typed. In our case, it's games. And then appending it to the request right here with append a path. Okay, and then that's it. Then it's handled. Um, 
So it has to do that for every single term in the grammar. So that's a lot of work. Like making one of these interpreters is quite, is quite extensive. And I am very thankful to everyone who's done it so that I can use these nice, clean, easy functions. Um, but uh, using it isn't the same as, as in, in, you know, implementing one of these. Although implementing one is really fun, like once you do it a couple times. So from, again, from the user's view, so back out of the library implementation view and into the user's view, this is all you need, client API. And now I have a function that will return me a list of games. Okay, so here's actually using the function in a main, right? So um, in Haskell, you ha in order to get to the network, you set up a, a network resource handler, and then I have to get the URL, so I parse my URL here. So that's all I have is a resource handler and a URL, and then I pass it whatever you know, API function I want, and it'll return a list of games for me. So um, I'll show that after I get through, yeah. Uh, okay, so it depends on where it was. So um, here, I, I use manager prime because I copied it out of a real program. And in the real program, manager was already defined. So I defined manager prime just as a separate manager. But you might have seen it, let me go back, like here. Yeah, so here it means something very different. It means I have some stuff that I want to use in the type level that's normally from the value level. That's exactly what this means. It means quoted. I don't know if you know any Lisp, but like in Lisp you kind of use quoting things. It's not the same, but you can think of it as like a metaphor for that. At least that's what I do. Okay, so look back. We've got a type level language and we've got different interpreters. Um, Lots of correctness checking, right? So there's all kinds of little details that are, you know, being assured. Some stuff that's being done for us. Um, but, you know, all that extra work has already been done for your base cases, and you get to use all that stuff for free. Um, but I want more stuff. I want to have my tests automated. I want auth. I want docs. I want to generate APIs in other systems. Servant says yes. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is how you can generate tests. Um, uh, we use Servant for microservices a lot. The, the um, having such a very specific API really helps address a very common problem in microservices, and that is that the complexity of your program tends to migrate from each application and into the messages of the application. Um, so a really common uh, pattern in uh, microservice architecture. So Servant helps mitigate that by making all of the messages that you, type, that you, that you use, first of all, very type safe, and secondly, shareable between client and server in that type safe manner. However, um, anytime that you're talking about uh, doing types and sending it over a network, you always have serialization. And serialization is sort of the enemy of types. Like once you serialize something, all your typed information becomes tag information and isn't, you know, the compiler doesn't know anything about it. So the, at that boundary layer, you want to write a certain set of tests. Uh, at, I feel like the right le, uh, set of tests are round trip and golden tests. And Servant ASON Specs is a package that's written on top of Servant that allows that to happen. Um, so first let me talk a little bit about what a round trip test is. So we have some type A and some serialization S, right? So when you serialize A to S, and you might want to unserialize S and go back to A. All a round trip test does is says, uh, if you serialize A and then unserialize that serialization, you get the same result back. That's all you want. It's an incredibly important test, though. Um, you, you know, if, if you're doing anything that has to do with serialization, it's, it's sort of a bare minimum test that you want to write. Golden tests are sort of another level of that. So um, most programmers don't write a program and never touch it again. At least I don't write a program and never touch it again. Usually I am constantly changing programs. And if you're constantly changing programs, saying that you know some serialization uh, A to S and S to A is consistent is nice, but it's not enough. What you really want to know is that the serialization hasn't changed after you changed your program. 
or that if it has changed, you've made all the updates necessary to catch all the places where it changed. That's what a golden test is all about. Um, so golden tests uh, take your serializer and write uh, uh, an instance of A to a file and then compare that file with a stored file and make sure that they're the same. So very simple, like you just you write a file with some data you know about and compare it to a file that's already there. Um, if your serialization has changed, then that'll, then that'll um, break, right? Because one will look different than the other. Um, round trip tests are pretty common in Haskell. Golden tests are starting to catch on. I don't know, is, are golden tests something that you guys hear about in other instances, something anyone's heard about? Yeah, that's strange. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh huh. Oh. Oh, I, I might want to hear more about that later. That's a, especially if it's in Jest. That's uh, he was saying that there's a Jest snapshot tool. That that's that's maybe even a level further than what I'm talking about. That's cool. Um, okay. Right, right. And then, I mean, if it's changing the DOM, can it, can it catch, like, other DOM elements there? Well, it'll, it'll fail the test. Right. Very cool. Okay. Well, this isn't generating stuff that's that neat, but it's generating um, a lot of tests for you in a very, very little space. So this is the... Uh, basically the complete code to generate both round trip and golden tests. You write this, you put your, here we have our, um, this is gonna be, in our case, our list API, right? Our spec proxy, which is list API. And then this interpreter will interpret that list API into a set of round trip tests and into a set of golden tests. Um, in, and that's all you write. You just write that in your test and then you have it. And I'll show that in the code here in just a minute, but okay, maybe that's not all you write. You also have to write all these things. Um, it's a lot of little boilerplate functions. Uh, Haskell has a tool called Quick Check, and it allows it to generate instances of a given type. So basically, you have to call this function over and over to have it generate all your arbitrary instances of different types um, that are involved. But Servant will tell you which, which ones you need, and I'll show that here in a minute too. Okay, so like, as, like I said, uh, Servant will tell you which, which type you need. So if I tried writing just this, um, well, it knows I need a game. It knows I need some sort of game in order to be able to serialize game. And so it says there's no instance for an arbitrary game. And so it says I, know, I, know, I now know I need to write that. Okay, so in addition to tests, another important thing is documenting your API so that other people can use it. Um, Swagger is a very popular documentation system. Uh, this is how you write a Swagger document, uh, generate a Swagger documentation in Servant. You call Swagger this, and it makes it, and you're done. Um, again, really, there's a caveat where you have to write these, the same sort of things. You have to write these things again, right? Except it's say to Swagger for your types. But then it finishes it up for you. And I'll show both of those. Um, OK, so I don't like pretending that things are perfect whenever I'm talking about them. Servant has problems. Um, error handling is probably the biggest problem that I feel like. Uh, we use this extensively. I mean, we have, I don't know, like a hundred different servant APIs. And um, the, the thing about everything at the type level is if you type something wrong, it can give you very cryptic error messages. Um, you get used to it and understand how to look at it, but until you do, it can be very confusing. Um, and then lastly is, a, is an obvious one. Haskell is a smaller community than a lot of programming languages, and so you don't have as many plugins as you would with some other um, API tools. You know, I know Swagger is a, obviously an API tool, and you can generate a lot of stuff with it. Yeah, uh, I think the probably my favorite thing about Servant is, until I saw it, I was pretty skeptical of a lot of the really um, advanced features of Haskell types. Um, you know, I, I've been a Haskell programmer for a long time, but um, I, 
hadn't really played around with much of the new dependently typed features. Um, Servant really showed me a lot of benefit to those features. And in fact, you know, there have been a lot of clone projects since that, since it's come out. For instance, uh, there's a Bluetooth library that you can use that's written in a very similar fashion. Um, and we use that in some embedded projects. Um, but, you know, seeing what you can do with a type level DSL has been really interesting. Um, and then uh, I'll post these on Slack, but I made a list of resources if you're interested. You can kind of see different stuff. There's a servant paper, which is a great paper, and you know, just different places to look up information. Um, but I was going to show just a little bit of the actual uh, using of servant now. And. So there's three different web servers it can use. It can use Scotty. Well, Scotty uses Warp, so I guess it uses Warp or Lucid. Um, yeah, and so here I have Warp. Let's see, where am I in now? I'm in presentation server. Let me let me pull up the code. So this is uh, some code I wrote to to demonstrate list games here. So I. I think I already showed this in a slide. Okay. So, um, like I said, you have to have your list API, which is right here. And again, that's how it's defined. Notice at the value level, it's just proxy. Only at the type level is it list API. Only at the type level do you see this show up. And then here's our type list API that we saw from earlier. And, um, and this is our game type. And I did a lot, of, a lot of parsing stuff. And you can pull this down and play. It all, it all compiles really easily. So if you are interested in playing with it, you can. And if it doesn't compile or something, just hit me up on Slack. I'll be glad to help. Um, but these are all the different types that are defined. Oh, and let me show you some of the tests. I think some of that's really interesting. So. Come back here and go to the tests. Uh, hold on, gotta change my targets. Okay, so these are all those arbitrary instances that I said I had to define in order to use this spec. And I just wanted to show like what happens if they're not defined. And actually when I was, when I was writing this uh, program, I messed up my time definition for the serialization and deserialization, and my test caught it. I was cracking up because it's totally it's really easy to do. Um, but let me get all these commented out and kind of see. So, um, okay, so what is it saying here? It's saying, can you guys see? Or should I make it bigger? Better? Okay, so what is it saying here? No instance for arbitrary game, right? From a use of API specs. Well, what was API specs again? That was our interpreter on, on our spec. So, all right. And like, I mean, you can kind of see what I'm talking about, about the errors being a little bit kind of hard to read. Um, this is the newest version of GHC, and they're actually better than they used to be. But So I'm going to go ahead and enable my arbitrary instance and then see what happens. And it says, hey, you still don't have game date, right? So that's kind of what I meant about, you know, you go through piece by piece and it tells you everything you're missing. So, you know, moving on, now, now the next one it says, oh, you don't have UTC time. And on down the line. Anyway, I'll enable everything now. So you don't miss any of the types that are involved, which is really nice because it's easy to miss a type whenever you're trying to write these round trip tests. We used to write them all by hand, and it was awful. So this is much nicer. Um, and I'll show you the swagger stuff too, what it looks like when it runs. Yeah, there it 
this stack. Sick. So I'm just going to um, start the, the Swagger server up so that I can show these docs. Uh-oh. Stack build. Oh, maybe it's presentation doc gen. That's probably what it is. Stack exec action. Oh, I'm in presentation doc gen. Well, let me look and see what it is. Cause I don't remember. All right, so then to see the documentation, I go to Swagger UI. Yay. And so this is the documentation that it generates, right? Just a standard Swagger form. Again, it's all like generated for you. Shows you the minimum, maximum of an integer, right? So if I had had a, um, a different type, um, I could have changed these values. And if I had made this like a little bit, you know, I could, I could make this look prettier. It's just for a demo. Um, and you can also annotate all these things as well. But yeah, so, you know, that's generated for you. Um, also, everything I've done has been with one route, but you can have, you know, a hundred routes. I just figured like it was confusing enough with one route. Um, but you know, the, the composer for adding routes, uh, is just, it just looks like this. It's uh, the Haskell alternative composer with a little colon at the start. And that's how you add different routes together. Um, no, um, it, it really doesn't. We do a lot of that manually, yeah. So, you know, as opposed to a tool like, um, um, streams or Akka or something like that. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything like that. Uh, we use it with other tools that do have those things built in and we use it as the resource request inside of those tools. So we'll write like a conduit or a stream and um, use it as the mechanism to call to that resource. So it's w very well typed um, calls. I'm sorry, uh, Jordan asked if it had a, uh, if it had a thread pooling or a, um, or a uh, you know, back pressure handling system built in. No, it's, and it's, it's very specifically for what it is. Um, but I think it would be really interesting to use it as an API specification in a tool like that. You know, uh, in, in Haskell, there's a thing called Cloud Haskell or Distributed Haskell. I don't remember which one they're calling it now. It's been a while since I looked. But um, it has a auto serialization method. And I thought it would be really cool to have something like this built on top of it. Um, but I don't know if anyone's doing anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's about all I have, I guess. I guess it's a little early. Yeah. Uh, so he was asking if the if the round trip type tests are both on the producing and consuming side. Um, so I could, so I wouldn't. I think I'm going to write some stuff down and tell me if it's kind of what you're saying. Like, so like we have a, let me make it all big. So if we have a, a serializer A to S in the example that I showed, and then another serializer, you know, S to A or deserializer S to A. In my example, I showed that SA was equal to U of SA. Are you saying like, do I have an example where we're making sure that like SA, or sorry, US is equal to SA? Because that would be to me like a consumer, like right. on the other side. And so, so our round trip engine does not do that. But it has totally come up. Like I call that like an inner equality check because you're trying to check that intermediate step to make sure they are the same. Because you're right. Like just because, just because it works to go from A to S and back doesn't mean that the S's are the same. 
as what you would expect on the client. If you're using Servant to handle both your client and your server, this isn't a problem at all. Um, but if you're using some other external tool that is going to expect a more specific JSON representation, it could be a problem. Um, the short answer, the reason we don't do that test is because I feel like golden tests catch that, right? Because golden tests are already on the inner specification. And because our tooling is set up to write both golden and round trip tests at exactly the same time, we'll catch that inner specification check. But it's definitely, like, it's definitely a thing to think about. That's a good question. I like that question. I like tests. I think a lot about tests. You know, I, I, there's a, a lot of Haskell programmers, well, functional programmers also, just in general, is I feel like there's this animosity between testing and types as though they're not supposed to live together or something. But, I mean, it's just absurd. To me, like, liking types means you like tests so much you want them everywhere all the time and don't want to miss them at all. I mean, that's what types are to me. That's, you're, get, you're, you're making yourself go through the pain of writing tests all of the time. Um, and if you're not looking at it that way, um, I don't know, that's just strange. I, anyway, that's all I have, I guess. Yeah. So kind of segue from that, do you have any general advice for the things that you've observed about your development practices with a really tight relationship with your client? Like, what do you do Yeah, no, that's that's fine. Sure. Um, so Jordan asked me if I had any advice about like using like a strongly typed language, um, and how much that's changed the way I code. Um, well, I mean, it's drastically, drastically changed the way I code. But uh, you know, there are several. It's really interesting because I'm fortunate enough to work with a team of developers. Um, we all have a lot of different styles about how we do things. Um, but I think one thing that we have in common is it's not just that we use APIs or types to, you know, constrain our programs. It's how, how we think about their design. And I'd say that's probably the biggest change in me is that when I'm thinking about designing a program, even when I'm working in JavaScript or, um, uh, Python, which I lately have had to do, um, even when I'm working in languages like those, I'm still imagining the types in my head um, as I go. And so it's not uncommon for me to write a function like this where that big there, where you know I'll write like a and then I'll write that, which you can do in Haskell. It's, it's called a typed hole. And then you know I'll have foo here and then have some term here and then do some stuff and then write a hole here, right? And so then the Haskell, the Haskell compiler will tell me. Uh, what term it, what type it expects here, and what this evaluates out to according to my language, and being able to do stuff like that is really really nice. Um, uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of little um, ways of expressing a program. You know, even just like pattern matching. I think pattern matching is an amazing, you know, an amazing tool for understanding a program and really thinking concretely about all your cases. You know, when you write if-then statements, you just don't tend to think about um, different cases of your program in the same way. But yeah, I can go on a long time about why I like types. I, I really, really like types to the point that um, we've bent over backwards to use types everywhere. Uh, you know, we run GHCJS on the front end, um, which is, isn't good. I, w I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, but we finally found a good alternative reason. And uh, we, we run a lot of uh, code on the back end. You know, we use Haskell in, embedded code a lot. You know, we'll use them on um, a lot of ARM processors. And, um, you know, that's been mixed. We're, we're starting to experiment with some other type languages. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think it's very, very worthwhile. Just being able to, the way you can hand a program off to, like you can hand a program off to somebody else and they can look at the type signatures and really understand it. Um, that, that might just be their developer experience, but I feel like that it has a lot to do with being able to read those type signatures. All right, anything else? I'm a little early, I know. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>